Good morning, friends. It's a pleasure to be here today. And thank you, Mr. Samir Kocha, for inviting me to talk about patriotism. The topic given to me is uh, early Indians and contemporary patriotism. And I assume it's because of the book I have recently written, titled Early Indians, the story of our ancestors and where we came from. But what really is the connection between history and patriotism? There is a quotation by British historian E.J. Hobsbawm, uh, which nicely defines the relationship between history and nationalism. It says, historians are to nationalists what poppy growers are to heroin addicts. <laughs> they create the essential raw material that the market demands. Of course, uh, E.J. Hob Hobsbawm is talking about a kind of nationalism, uh, which is jingoistic and has been shown uh, in the, uh, repeatedly in the European history, especially in the uh, last century, which led to uh, uh, multiple wars. There is a jing uh, jingoist version of nationalism uh, which is defined by, uh, by a belief in the superiority of one's country and therefore the resulting desire to subdue other countries around you as happened in Europe. Pat uh, patriotism on the other hand is usually defined uh, as a love and affection for one's country and an intense desire for it to do well without closing one's eyes to the defects that have to be improved upon. It's in the second sense of the patriotism that I will be talking today. And uh, what is its relation with prehistory? If you assume that love and affection and intense desire to do well for your country and for all your citizens, it does uh, help to know who we are and where we come, came from and what holds us together. Of course, you don't need to know all of these things because we are all humans and all humans are 99.9% .9 similar genetically. Uh, so whether to love each other or the countrymen, we don't need to know this, but it does help. But until very recently, there was no real scientific way of knowing how various populations across the world were formed or were put together. All that we, ha we had were mythologies and stories. But this has vastly changed in the last few years uh, because of a new field called population genetics that has acquired the ability to extract ancient DNA from people who lived thousands or even tens of thousands of years ago and analyze it and understand uh, how people moved from where to where and when. And this has drawn uh, our, uh, given us new insight into how populations form not just all across the world, not just in South Asia, for example, in Europe, we know that just in the last 10,000 years, the population has gone through two major uh, turnovers or, or change. Uh, first, uh, there were farmers from West Asia, and, or to be specific, Anatolia, who moved into Europe around uh, 9,000 years ago and either replaced or mixed with the then existing hunter-gatherer population of Europe. We also know that about 5,000 years ago, uh, another significant migration from the steppe uh, moved into Europe, then again either replaced or mixed with the then existing farmer and hunter-gatherer populations. We know that in the Americas, uh, uh, the, the continent was formed by at least three migrations from Asia, and this is even before the Europeans landed there. We know in East Asia, similar, uh, so every part of the world, we now have a far better understanding of how populations formed. What do we know about South Asia then? My book uh, talks about the four prehistoric migrations that formed in the Indian population as it is today. The first one, the first migration happened around 65,000 years ago when the out of Africa migrants, uh, this is the first out of Africa migration that happened around 70,000 years ago. Uh, which then later went on to populate all of the non-African world. They arrived in India, the first modern humans in India, the first homo sapiens in India around 65,000 years ago. They did not arrive into an empty land. It was already populated by uh, earlier homo species. 
So it did take them time to fill out the continent. And by around 35,000 years ago, we can say that they were masters of all that they saw in South Asia. So this is the first migration. And my book calls them the first Indians. The second migration happened around uh, 9,000 years ago from West Asia when pastoralists uh, or herders from, uh, from the region of Zagros in Iran, uh, a region that was already beginning to see the agricultural revolution that was happening at that point of time around in many parts of the world, including in India. So a group of uh, a population of uh, herders from the Zagros region of Iran arrived in the northwestern India, mixed with the then existing population of first Indians, the descendants of the, or the, of the, of the first migrants who came to India, and then uh, spread agriculture across the northwestern region of India that would today include Pakistan, India, and parts of Afghanistan. And uh, this is the agricultural revolution that went on to become develop into the Harappan civilization. My book calls them the Harappans, and this is the second migration. The third migration happened from Southeast Asia uh, around uh, 4,000 years ago or a little a few centuries later, which brought Austroasiatic language speakers into India. These are languages such as Mundari and Khasi, which are spoken by tribals in Central India and Eastern India today, and these languages are, are linked are part of the family of languages called Mon Khmer, which are spoken in Vietnam, in Thailand, and in other parts of Southeast Asia. The fourth and last major migration happened from Central Asia, uh, when pastoralists uh, from the steppe region, or today around the, uh, what would today be Kazakhstan, uh, arrived in India around between 4,000 to 3,000 years ago, bringing Indo-European languages and mastery of our metallurgy and horses. These are the four major constituents of the Indian population as it stands today. So what can we learn from it and what can we learn about each other uh, from this? There are quite a few surprising results. Uh, the first one is that uh, no matter where in the country you are today, uh, no matter where in the caste hierarchy you stand, no matter what region you inhabit, what language you speak, what religion you belong to, all, most all populations of the country today have 50 to 65 percent of their ancestry from the first Indians. This is new. We did not know this earlier. In fact, we used to ask, where did the, where, where the first Indians? Where, where can we find them? Do we have to go to Andaman Islands? Do we have to? The, the real answer to the question is, we have to look into the mirror, because the, the ancestry of the first Indians still dominates. Uh, the ancestry of, of, of South Asia. My book calls this, the, uses the metaphor of the pizza to understand Indian demography. And the first Indian ancestry is the base or the foundation of the pizza. Without it, the, the pizza doesn't stand. So, and that's what distinguishes us. And on top of that pizza is the sauce. I call the Harappans the sauce. Why is that? Because the Harappan civilization started declining around uh, 1900 BCE. And when that started happening, because of a long drought that affected many civilizations around the world around, the, around that time, they spread into the rest of the, uh, everywhere they could go, in both the North India and South India. In effect, uh, they became the source that spread over the base. And they, in many ways, therefore, the Harappans are the ancestors of both North Indians and South Indians, both genetically and culturally, because we would be surprised to know how many of our practices and beliefs that we today hold dear uh, can be traced back to the practices that were perfected in the crucible of the Harappan civilization. So this is the sauce on the base. And then there are is the cheese and the toppings, which are obviously the later migrations, including the Austroasiatic migrations that happened uh, from Southeast Asia, and the migrations from Central Asia that brought into European language speakers. They are not spread uniformly around the whole of the pizza, uh, but more or less all regions have them, but it's uh, less uniformly spread. It also includes, of course, the migrations that happened much after this period, even into the historical period, whether it is the Jews, the Parsis, the Arabs, the Greeks, the Huns, the Shakas, uh, you know, the, the, there's a whole long list of them. 
uh, all of them, none of them made a significant dent or a mark on the Indian demography as it stands today, though they did contribute significantly to the culture, much more than the demographic contribution. So this is the uh, base, and this is the population that we know uh, now, now today. And there are some striking things with this understanding, which allows us to look at question some of our existing assumptions. For example, many of us have thought or have assumed that the tribals, for example, are somehow very different from the rest of the population. Now we know that this doesn't stand. Why doesn't it stand? Because 50 to 65 percent of the ancestry of Indians, all most population groups in India, come from the first Indians, and that's what something that they will share with the tribals. The tribals, in that sense, are us, us in the inverted commas. We also know um, that uh, gen from, from genetics we know, for example, that between 4,000 years ago to, to the beginning of the common era, that's uh, hundreds, around 100 CE, there was significant mixing that happened, genetic mixing that happened between all the four major population migrations that happened in India, of the kind that was never seen before or later. This is important. So what you're saying is that in the period soon after the decline of the Indus Valley of the Harappan civilization, when people moved and there were new migrants coming in, both from the east and from uh, Central Asia, and that period so uh, mixing between the, these population groups of a kind that has never been seen before, and that left no population group in India untouched. Today, no matter where in the country you take, even the remotest uh, population group that you take, you will find that they are mixed. The only group that stayed outside of this mixing uh, were people in the Andaman Islands who were cut off from the mainland, and therefore, obviously, were not part of this uh, party, so to say, that was going on for 2,000 years. And uh, around 100 CE, the genetic says, the new genetic studies say that the mixing started sto uh, stopped and that endogamy or the practice of uh, marrying within one's own community uh, took, started taking hold in various parts of the country. Uh, that's the, we could say that's the beginning of the caste system, but there are, it also shows us two or three important things. It shows that the caste system did not begin with the arrival, for example, of the mig last migrants. It happened much later. It also shows that the caste system does not have a genetic, a real genetic backing to, because we are already mixed. And uh, so these are some of the new findings that allows us to see that the Indian civilization, the common civilization that we cre created together out of very different migration histories, uh, practices, uh, and uh, th that is, in, in many ways, it holds the uh, old ancient cliche that of unity in diversity. And this is, uh, we made a common civilization, in other words, out of diverse threads of, uh, of population groups, and we are, in, a, in any which way that you look at it, we are mixed and we are all migrants. And that's what makes us related, that's also what holds us together. And uh, so I think we today have a far better uh, factual and scientific basis and a foundation to base our patriotism on. Thank you very much.